Hi guys, um, my name is Mars Kapadia, and here I am today to teach about Connectify. So what Connectify is, is throughout my time, I've done cybersecurity research and tried to emulate the process of TPM, or Trusted Platform Security. In learning how this works, I actually adopted this feature, or this adaptation, from Windows 11. With the installation of Windows 11, there is this really unique hardware requirement that's also implemented within brand new MacBooks that enables the use of a cryptographic phone processor to be embedded within the actual machine. I always wondered, what was this for? What was the use? And why do we have this being used in our modern devices? Throughout my time, I found an exploit within a large cybersecurity company, and I used these processes just to show how easy it is to leak this information. And here, I'm going to show you one of these processes today. So to start off, we have TSP Door Generator. TSP Dork Generator actually lets you take links and convert them to dorks. Dorks are nothing more than a search term that lets you access indexable data by large search engines. What this means is that search engines index more data than they legally should. Instead of this indexing data, for example, like Facebook.com or Microsoft.com, that lets you access the data that you're looking for, they index data that they shouldn't. Data like your routing number, bank information, social security number. And what these tools let me do is they let me take a wide variety of keywords. Keywords are nothing more than a targeted system. In order to make an attack targeted and actually to do what I want, you have to have a wide variety of keywords that let you specify what you want to access from the search engine. These keywords are implemented into an SQL query function, which is called the door. The keywords are generated from search engines, and these keywords are then used in TSP door generator which takes these keywords and makes them into these functions that you can use to access these hidden, otherwise non-accessible index data. From TSP Dork Generator, here we have Dork Searcher Easy. With Dork Searcher Easy, I'm able to take these dorks and convert them into live URL links. What this means is that from accessing the dorks, which you can't really access without the program, I'm actually able to find the websites where these data is accessed. This data is hidden on seemingly unknown websites. Websites such as Russian tutoring websites. Completely random things that actually house such random information like Amazon logins, Netflix logins, Spotify logins. It almost seems like it's put there intentionally. Intentionally to create a system, a system that can be fueled by exploits that have been yet to patch by large organizations. Dork Searcher Easy is a tool that makes use of proxies. Proxies such as SOX, S4, or S5. These proxies can be used as a sort of encryption protocol, not in an official sense, but encryption in that it allows you to anonymize your access to these search engines. What this means is that instead of searching these engines with my one computer, as you can see, we have the HTTP proxy, and I can search these, com I can search these search engines with 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 computers all at once. So in searching these search engines, you can access data within seconds. So now you can go from targeting the data you actually want to seeing real website links that you can go to, such websites that you wouldn't expect these data to be housed on. Once you have these websites, now how do we exploit them? How do we go to the next level of actually dumping the SQL database and getting the data we need? To dump the SQL database, here we have SQL I dumper. At School I Dumper is a traditionally $20,000 software that got leaked illegally. What this allows you to do is to dump the SQL databases that store the data. So from here, you can go from the dork, the link, the keyword, and actually have these websites. Websites which you actually see here, you have Korea, Brazil, Russia, the United States, Netherlands, South Africa. It's an international exploit system that has been fueled by large corporations that has been yet to been patched an international system that was actually used in the leaking of UC Berkeley social security numbers. This system, I do not know why it has been patched, but for some reason, it has been live ever since the creation of SQL. SQL is nothing more than a backend database structure, a database being that your website can house data, data that updates. For example, if you're on your bank and you're seeing your account balance, that value is actually a data stored in a table. SQL manages these tables, it manages these data to enable anyone to access the website easily and the website to be live, 
live thing that is auto-updating, such as like a news website. It has to change every day. <coughs> By using these tools, you can actually access this data fairly easily, and then from there, you've got to determine if it's injectable. Injectable meaning you can take an SQL query-based form and input non-commanding non terms is the best way I can say it. For example, if you're in your username or password login setup, instead of actually putting what the username or password would be, you would put in a code. A single piece, maybe a string, boolean, integer, that allows you to communicate with the SQL backend. If you were to do this incorrectly, you usually get an Apache error message, but if you do it correctly, you're actually able to harvest the data from these websites. So for example, in your Facebook log, you wouldn't put your username or your password. You would put a single piece of code. So this is already a pretty cool attack, but how do you make this more widespread? You make this more widespread through the use of SOX S5 proxies. SOX S5 proxies are nothing more than lists of harvested IP addresses from malicious computers. So now you can target mass websites through over thousands of computers using software that lets you automatically input these SQL query terms in these forum searching areas that lets you target this data and determine if the website's actually injectable. Injectable meaning it will respond to the code you input that wasn't intended by the original author. For example, if you input a special line of code, it will actually give you the passwords, the usernames, and any other information that you're trying to find. It won't just log you in to your Facebook, to your Bank of America, to your Chase. It'll actually give you something that you're trying to find. So from here, I've always wondered, these tools, they are extremely powerful, they cost upwards of $20,000, yet they're leaked illegally for free all the time. You have forums like Black Hat Russia and other forums that are posted in the dark web. And over here, you can find these source codes and you can find them relatively easily. I've always started to wonder, why? Why can you get such expensive programs to the point where any script kitty or low-level hacker is able to use these programs and actually hack into devices relatively easy and with an extreme amount of power? And with that, we have a hidden ecosystem. A hidden ecosystem where you have a middleman. A middleman, the man who crafts these tools and makes them available for free to hackers. He makes these tools in such a way that while taking other people's passwords, these tools take your own passwords. If we go back, here we have the XQLI dumper. It runs on your own network, and it spreads in your router. From your router, it spreads in your phone. Any USB is connected, it spreads there. And it continuously harvests your passwords and uploads them to these websites. These same websites that you can see here, things that are such as a Russian tutoring website, your passwords are also uploaded to websites like these. It's continuously fueling a hidden ecosystem that enables hacking to be a very systemless approach. So from here, here we have an example of a door. Without using an automated tool, a door is nothing more than a really weird search term. It doesn't look like your traditional Google search. And even if you actually look at the websites, these descriptions, they're a bit weird. For example, if you were on Facebook, it would usually say like, Facebook, a social website. But over here, it's spinning out usernames, passwords, all just from a Google search engine. And it doesn't stop here. We aren't just talking about Google. Google, Bing, MySpace, Ask, Yahoo. Yahoo being extremely easy to target. So from here, let's say we actually put in a website. What do we get? We get a dump of usernames and passwords. These usernames and passwords, anyone can literally access by typing a certain command in the search engine on their phone, laptop, smartwatch, or anything. It's that easy to harvest this data. But it doesn't stop here. I've always thought in the back of my mind, this is a little too easy. It should definitely be harder harder than typing in a small search term in a search engine to get usernames, passwords, bank information, literally anything else you want, delivered in your fingertips right from search engines themselves. So where do we go from here? Here we have the man who originally created these tools. And what he did was really special. These tools were created for penetration testing. But what happened here is when they were cracked, or when they were made for use in an illegal manner, there was a special piece of code that made the tools also have a back-end program that was hidden from the actual user. 
So these tools. Here you have over 37 viruses. Viruses being Trojans, malware, adware, you name it, they're on these tools. A tool for hackers, created by hackers, is never a good thing. When dealing with these tools, people try and use obscuration methods, things like virtual machines, uh, offshore RDPs, even things like using networks that are subnetted to other like ISPs, for example, yet these tools still seem to get their passwords <laughs> because they're using closed source exploits. Closed source exploits, meaning they aren't actually made known to your antivirus. The viruses in these tools are so new. Things like Windows Defender, McAfee, they just aren't trained to catch it because they aren't released to the public. If you have a very small population, it actually makes what you're doing very hard to be found out. The biggest viruses that are known, things like uh, WannaCry, for example, they're big and known because they target a wide variety of users. But some of the most potent viruses target a small, selective group of users, and they're almost kept under the wraps. The minute a virus is made known and made public, it gets patched and exploited, but they don't want this to happen. As the CTO, Slavik, said, in the UC Berkeley attack, they suspected it was SQL injection. SQL injection, or SQL injection for short, is what was depicted here. What happened here was the social security numbers of UC students were actually leaked. And yet, for some reason, these exploits haven't been hacked. Haven't been hacked. These exploits have been hacked, but they haven't been patched yet. These tools are almost too easy to use, and even after these massive attacks, these methodologies, these tools, they have never been patched in a way or form that allows it to not happen again. While the site themselves can be patched, the ways to do it aren't. And the ways to do it are all fueled by search engines. Search engines are the only way I'm allowed to create keywords. You can use tools like Keyword Tool IO, and you can actually input a search term. For example, you can use like NordVPN, and you can actually generate uh, usernames and passwords from NordVPN. You literally say a word, and what you want, you can get. It's really as simple as that. Now we have a second tool. This being a leisure. A leisure takes the SQL injection process and simplifies it even further. To the point where instead of having to go through the keywords, dorks, links, jump through 20 different tools to get your password, all you do is you input a list of keywords and proxies. These keywords being things like what do you want? Do you want Netflix? Do you want Amazon? Do you want social security numbers? You input it here, and you get your answer. This is ridiculously easy to get, and I've always thought, why is it this easy? And furthermore, where is this tool getting its information from? It almost seems a bit too good to be true. You input what you want, you get a full list, so in this case, what's covered in red are the actual emails, what's after the colon or passwords. These are real. They are actual real things. If you plug them into the service, which I can't say, you will be locked in. So I've always wondered, where does it get this from? It makes no logical sense. Having a decently proficient programming background, it's almost impossible to make a tool that you input something and you get sensitive information. Information that should be encrypted by like MD5 or SHA-256 encryption methods, which are highly secure. So I went to Wireshark. Wireshark is a tool that lets you analyze the network traffic of a program. Network traffic being, where does the program actually communicate with? For example, let's say you have a program such as uh, your phone. Your phone sends multiple pings to Google every second, multiple pings to Facebook, even if you don't have Facebook installed. This is because it's how your phone is programmed. Tools do a lot of information in the back end that you don't want it to do. So from here, it actually pulls them from a website called Pacemaker. This tool goes to Pacemaker, and it just pulls the usernames, passwords, whatever you want from a public file sharing website. But why would you have a second tool when I can just go on the website myself and pull the information I want? That's because this tool is also infected. These tools are infected with a botnet, a botnet being a newest botnet. This is one of the world's biggest malicious banking botnets that is spreading on phones and iPhones today. What this means is that it can actually spread on your phone, steal your Samsung Pay and Apple Pay information. And it is actually live right now and it's being put in malicious APKs in the Google App Store. So from here, this botnet is highly advanced. It has things like facial detection. 
as you're looking at your phone, the hacker knows you can see it and he won't control your phone. The minute you look away, he can actually change your screen. It can do accelerometer, gyroscopic detection, so let's say you try and run a VM to get infection on purpose, it knows that it's not a real phone, just to make it harder for cybersecurity research, researchers to discover what you're trying to do. Here we have the actual bot at hand. This is a real panel that is running the test network. Furthermore, here we have a list of IDs for their compromised phones, and on the right, we have a list of tags. You can also see that the credit card logo, you can harvest your credit card from your phone, you can export Android, and you can do injectables. So you can actually see what's possible for each device listed here. So we have this information, and what do we do with it? Here's where I try to start Connectify. Connectify is a program that makes use of cryptographic coprocessors to enable secure, integrated AI IoT integration for our future. Having a decent background and working on some projects on both the hardware and software side, I've tried to build a development processor. This development processor makes use of a processor that is used in Tesla self-driving cars to enable AI IoT integration in a seamless and easy manner. What this means is that the cryptographic coprocessor includes encryption. Encryption that's based off Windows CPM, it uses a system that is more secure than SHA-256, which is nothing more than the signature checking algorithm to make sure the file downloaded is the same on your end as it is in the server. So with this method, we can enable IoT production in a secure manner. This IoT production can also have an AI element. The processor is able to define neural networks alongside other low-level IoT prototypes. I also plan to build another kid version, a student-friendly version, that enables students to build a secure, connected future using actual professional products. How amazing would it be to have your kid being interfacing with a processor that's actually used in Tesla self-driving cars, and for them to work on cryptographic coprocessors, things that are used in IBM supercomputers that enable the encryption algorithms to be hyper-secure. It can communicate on public Wi-Fi networks while being secure. It can be in an infected network once infected by the aforementioned the new spotlight. And in that infection, it still won't get the attack. Why? Because I have a secondary processor, dedicated offload. It makes all these processes secure. I hope to have Connectify in every home that I can to make it easy for people to develop. And even besides developing, things like adding connectivity to your washers, dryers, microwaves. By having these circuit boards embedded there, it can make your household more secure and hopefully make your bank information not be made public. Thank you guys so much for your time, and I really appreciate you listening to my TED Talk.